powerful. Welcome to Soul Series. Welcome back to my Soul Series, our weekly half hour to be able to delve into, you know, all things really spiritual, to challenge the the status quo. That's what this show is all about, to connect to higher ground and thereby elevate the value of our experience here and now. Uh, the here and now, you know, that's an expression that's achieved in almost, um, you know, cult-like status in our lexicon. But as in any case, when phrases are used and overused in a culture, sometimes they tend to lose their influence and their impact. And people just sort of toss about the here and the now as a reference in time without actually considering, I think, the the magnitude of what those words really represent. Today, right now, I want to share with you somebody who has helped me along with millions of other people to really understand just why that phrase, the here and particularly the now, is not only vital, but is really all that there is. My guest today should be called, I guess, the father of the now, because Eckhart Tolle is um, widely recognized as one of the most original and inspiring spiritual teachers of our time. I personally think that uh, you are a prophet, Mr. Tolle, and I was uh, first introduced to your teachings back in two th- in the year 2000 when uh, uh, actress Meg Ryan was on my show and she told me about this book. We were in a commercial break. I don't even know how the subject came up, but she mentioned the power of now and how it was really uh, having a big impact on her life. And so I went right out and I got the book right away. And uh, I put it in my magazine as one of on the old list. And I, I think I, I even listed it as a favorite thing for Christmas for all of our viewers. The Power of Now, A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment would have to be one of the most transformative books in, in my life. It's always by my bedside, no matter where I am. I carry it with me. I was just saying before I was introducing you, Eckhart, that I wished I had my original, original, original copy because I've bought so many copies since the first copy. But my original, original copy, I had so many um, uh, yellow markings in it for highlighting every sentence. I just thought, well, why don't I just finish reading the book instead of highlighting everything? Welcome to to our Soul Series. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, uh, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Uh, I know we're not going to get to all of it, so I just want to tell all of our listeners now, those of you who are um, big supporters, uh, seekers, and and fans of his book, The Power of Now, that this conversation will be continued uh, next week. Uh, So today's discussion is really, I'm going to try to focus it on the now and the book, The Power of Now. I was so moved in the book when you said you very in the very beginning of the book you said 29 years old having pondered suicide you were thinking this quote i cannot live with myself any longer this was the thought that kept repeating itself in my mind and then suddenly i became aware of what a peculiar thought that was am i one or two if i cannot live with myself there must be two of me the i and the self that i cannot live with Maybe I thought only one of them is real. I love this because it's really one of the first times I I thought, yeah, that's right. When you say, I'm going to tell myself something, who is the I and who is the self? That's the fundamental question, is it not? Yes, that's right. The um, Most people are not aware that they have a, a little man or woman in their head that keeps talking and talking. So there's a voice in the head that's the ex- internal dialogue that most people are completely identified with. And in my case, and in many people's case, the voice in the head is a predominantly unhappy one. So there's an enormous amount of unhappiness that is continuously generated by this unconscious internal dialogue. And at that moment, that night, a separation occurred inside me between the voice, which is the incessant Uh, stream of thinking and the sense of self that had become identified with that voice in the head and a deeper sense of self that I later recognized as essentially consciousness itself. 
rather than something that consciousness had become through thinking. So that night the separation occurred and when I woke up the next morning I was completely at peace for the first time since my childhood without understanding why. The understanding came much later. So the important point here is that it's essential for people to become aware that their thought processes and the sense of self that is derived from their thinking, which includes, of course, all one's memories, all one's conditioning, one's sense of self is a conceptual one that is derived from the past. So all the stream of thinking really is a con form of conditioning of the past. So it's essential for people to recognize that this voice is going on inside them incessantly and it's always a breakthrough when people for the first time realize here is my thinking, here are all the, all the habitual thoughts that I've been having, repetitive thoughts, very often recurring negative thoughts, and they suddenly realize, and here I am knowing that these thoughts are going through my head. So the identification is suddenly broken, and that is for many people the first real spiritual breakthrough. Spiritual, as I see it, is not believing in this or that, but it's stepping out of identification with a stream of thinking. So you suddenly find there's another dimension deeper than thinking inside you. I sometimes call that stillness. Mm -hmm. It's an aware presence, just that. It's nothing to do with past or future. And that we could call also, it's, it's like waking up. That's why traditionally in many spiritual traditions they use the term awakening. Mm -hmm. So many people would tell you, well, what, what do you mean awakening? I'm awake already. But what is meant by awakening is that you wake up out of the stream of thinking. And when you wake up, you become present. A completely different dimension of consciousness is suddenly there. Well, I recall um, I, in, in Stillness Speaks, um, you talk about the awareness Stillness Speaks, the book Stillness Speaks is, is all about that awareness. Yes. And I love the line where you say, once you recognize, I'm, I'm paraphrasing of course, um, that that voice and that you are the observer of that voice, that that very awareness is you. That's right. And, and not, not the voice. So you recognize as essentially there's something inside you that has its place. It's the stream of thinking. Right. It's connected with the past. Mm -hmm. It contains all your memories. It mm -hmm. contains all reactive patterns. It contains old emotions and so on. They're all part of that. But essentially, it is not essentially who you are. And that's an amazing realization. Now, the mind, of course, may then ask, well, then tell me who I am. That's the big question. <laughs> I'm talking to Eckhart Tolle, uh, author of Power of Now. So what is the answer to that question? Well, the answer to that question is th who you are cannot be defined through thinking or through mental labels or mental definitions because it is beyond that. It is the very sense of beingness or presence that is there when you become conscious of the present moment. It's intrinsically one with what we call the present moment. You, I sometimes say, this, for some people might find this a little strange, but in essence, you and what we call the present moment at the most, at the deepest level, are one. <laughs> because you are the consciousness out of which everything comes. Every thought comes out of that consciousness that you are. Every thought disappears back into that space of consciousness that you are. So essentially you are a, a conscious, aware space. And all your sense perceptions, all your thinking, all your emotions happen, they come and go in that aware space. space yeah. Yes. Well, did it feel like, Eckhart, when this happened to you, that moment, of uh, realization where you realize the voice was separate from the awareness, that moment that you speak about in the beginning of the book, did it literally blow your mind? Yes, it did. 
but I didn't understand it. I just realized suddenly the next day I was at peace and I remained at peace. There was a deep sense of inner peace, although externally nothing had changed. So I knew something very drastic had happened, but it took me some years to actually understand what had happened. I, some years after, three years after this uh, transformation, I was talking to a Zen monk <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, he was telling me, he said, well, Zen basically is very simple. It's uh, you don't rely on thinking anymore. It means to to go beyond thinking. And I suddenly realized, oh, this is what has happened to me. That state that I felt was a state of inner peace was also a state of far less thinking than I had been doing before. All that unhappy thinking, all that repetitive thinking wasn't happening to me anymore. And so you have uh, often said in all of your books, you characterize thinking as a terrible affliction, even a disease, and that it's the greatest barrier to the power of now. But isn't to think to be human? I thought that's how we are different from other animals. That's right. Thinking can also be a powerful and wonderful tool. It only becomes an affliction if we are totally identified with thinking and we derive our sense of who we are from the stream of thinking. In that case, you're telling yourself continuously what I call sometimes the story of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And in many people's case, it's an unhappy story. So they, they are continuously dwelling on the past and there's nothing wrong with the past, but if there's complete self-identification with memory, then all your sense of who you are, your sense of identity, is then derived from the stream of thinking. And that's a dysfunctional and unhappy state. So when you step out of identification with that and you realize for the first time, I'm actually the presence behind thinking, Mm -hmm. then you are able to use thinking when it's helpful and needed, and it can be a wonderful thing. But you're no longer, I'll put it in, extreme terms, but it's true, you are no longer then possessed by the thinking mind. The thinking mind is then a servant or a helpful tool which you can use. It's useful for many situations in this world, Mm -hmm. but you can't find yourself in there. And also, if you can never be on the thinking mind, it interferes with relationships. It It creates continuous conflict in relationships if there is no sense of space in the relationship. Say that again, if there's no sense no, of space. No sense of space, that spacious, aware presence that you can be, bring to the relationship. For example, when you listen to someone, mm-hmm. you listen to your partner or you listen to a friend or just an acquaintance, can you be there as the aware space that is listening or are you, while the other person is speaking, continuously thinking, preparing the next thing you're going to say? Are you judging and evaluating what you're hearing? Are you just interested in your own aims and purposes? Or can you be there as the space for the other person? And I would say that's the greatest gift you can give a person. It is especially important for parents and children, but also very important in intimate relationships. Can you be there as the space, the aware, conscious space for the other person? For example, while you listen to the other person, can you listen in that simple state of alertness in which you're not judging what you're listening to? You're then there as a presence rather than as a person. Right. So there's the the deeper level of awareness is there, and that's what I call the space. I was going to say, you offer them that space in which you allow yourself to be connected to whatever it is they are offering. That's right. There's no judgment in that space. That's right. You're not defining the other person, and that's an enormous gift that you can give to another person. You're not imposing mental labels, judgments, definitions on the other person. I, funny thing, as, as you know, so many people love their pets, and there's an for some for many millions of people. So many that, people, I would be one of those people. Yes, me too. Okay. But now, for many people, that's the only area where they realize they can communicate and relate to another being, and that being is not judging them, because the dog accepts you 
unconditionally as you are. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard the saying, please God, make me into the person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> <laughs> so the people feel that sense of freedom when they relate to their pets because they are not being judged. <laughs> Now, the, the animal, of course, is at a state prior to thinking, so that's why the animal can be there as the simple natural presence. But when a human being is there, the human being has moved s beyond thinking, and that's the state of awareness. Well, but both these states are free of definitions and judgments. Jesus, of course, also talked a lot about the importance of not judging another person. Well, you know, because since the power of now, so many people have been introduced to the, to this very idea uh, that you presented to us in, in, in this book and, you know, are, are stimulated by the idea. And, and even I have had glimpses of that space. Oh, I'm sure you have. Yeah, glimpses of that space. But how can you live in that space? You seem to live in that space. Yes. Well, first of all, it's important to acknowledge and to be grateful for the glimpses of it yes. when they happen. And then you can actually not just wait for the space to happen almost as a kind of grace that comes into your life, right. which sometimes does happen. Right. But you can also invite that space simply by bringing more presence into your life, which means more present moment awareness. For example, I recommend that people use little everyday activities that they do every day unconsciously and mm -hmm. bring a conscious presence. When you wash your hands, when you make a cup of coffee, when you walk across a room, down the stairs, you're in the elevator, waiting for the elevator. These are all opportunities for, instead of indulging in thinking, being there as and a still alert presence. Yes, like a lot of people, you know, take showers in the morning. They're taking a shower, but they might as well already be in the office because they're thinking about, you know, getting in their car and what am I going to do today? And That's right. what, you know, what yes. is my to-do list? Yes. Instead of being present in the shower, feeling the water, the essence of the water, the moment, whatever. That's right. So it's bringing little spaces into your everyday life, as many spaces as possible. I say, for example, when you get into your car, Shut the door and be there for just half a minute. Feel your breathing, perhaps feel the energy inside your body. Look around, sky, the trees. It All it takes is half a minute. And the mind might tell you, I don't have time. Yes. <laughs> That's the mind talking to you. But I would suggest that even the busiest person has time for 30 seconds of space. Right. In, when they sit in their car, for example, or many other occasions. Well, you, I will have to tell you that uh, I think, it yes, it was. The year 2000, I first read this book, and many, many, many times this book has saved me. I mean, the theories in The Power of Now have saved me. And today, as a matter of fact, I had, uh, you know, one of the most hectic days. But yes. I remember waking up this morning thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be so stressed. I'm going to be so, so stressed. I let that go. I let those thoughts go. And just thought, I will just, for every moment of the day, be present now. Yes, that's a continuous refocusing on real what really matters, what matters most in anybody's life, which is always now, the present moment. People don't realize it, that that's really, that's all there ever is. There is no past or future except as memory or anticipation in your mind. But that's what throws me, though, in the book when you say there's no past. Of course, th there, there has to be a past because there are all of our memories. There are all these that's ways we defined ourselves. That's, yes. our, that's our past. Yes. On one level, you could say nobody can argue with the fact that there is such a thing as time. There is such a thing as future. Of course, we use time to meet here. We agreed on this particular time. We said right. we are going to meet on this day at that time. Otherwise, it would have been difficult. We might never have met. That's right. And you are hard to find <laughs> <laughs> in all the different countries. I'm talking to Eckhart Tolle, author of Power of Now. But we agreed on this time, and we are here because this is now. <laughs> That's right. So time, then, is something that we cannot do without. It, we could even say... Time is what dominates 
the entire this entire life that we experience here because this illusionary plane the, that we're on that's right right the, this i call it the surface level of reality Got is it. completely dominated by time which is the past and future in the continuous stream and people look to time very often for expecting that time will eventually fulfill them time will eventually give them what they need time will eventually give them happiness and sometimes of course it does for a while but essentially the true happiness you cannot find by looking to into the future because it is intrinsically one with living deeply in the present moment so it has been said <laughs> there are two ways of being unhappy one is not getting what you want and the other is getting what you want <laughs> right because if you think this that or the other is going to make me happy even when you get it and you haven't realized that the present moment is all you ever have you will again be focusing on the next moment and always expecting because it's a mental pattern that has is very deep seated always focusing always expecting something in the next moment, never being fully in this moment. Well, another thing that changed me when I read The Power of Now over seven years ago was your um, com comments about the fact that all of our stresses, every stress that you have is based upon, uh, for the most part, thinking about what happened in the past or what should be happening in the future. That if you're able to take a deep breath, no matter what crisis is going on in your life, and look at what is happening now hmm. in this moment right now that's I'm right. okay that's right another way of putting it would be to say when pe many people identify them their whole their whole sense of self with problems right. problems they're continuously involved in problems and so for many people their whole sense of identity is intimately bound up with the problems they have or think they have and often just as a reality test I tell people just a moment I say just say what problem do you actually have at this moment just focus see what the problem you have at this not not in an hour's time or tomorrow morning but what problem do you have now and sometimes people would suddenly wake up when they hear that question because they have to realize at this moment I don't actually have a problem what you might have is a challenge if something a danger arises a wild animal animal jumps into this room <laughs> mm -hmm. that's a challenge and then of course it's not a problem because there's no time to make it into a problem so f to f for a problem to exist you need time and you need mind activity repetitive mind activity in the present moment there may be a challenge that is true there may even be pain there may be an emotion but not what we call problem. So when people think, how do I get out of my problems? I suggest go into the present moment and see what is the problem now. And then you will always have to admit, well, right now, I don't actually have a problem. And people got that, even people who are in prison. I've had letters from people in prison, some are in for life, Mm -hmm. They've written to me and said, I understood your message and I have become free. And they meant free inside. Wow. Free of problem making. Yes. So, uh, yes, similar to uh, Viktor Frankl and his and Man's Search for Meaning. Yes. 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 Free of problem making. I want to ask you, you know, as I completed the book and have read and reread it many times over the years, portions of it, all of it. Uh, listen to the tapes. I often wonder, do you live like this all the time? Are you always in the now? Yes, I'm basically in the now, surrendered to what happens. Occasionally, uh, if I see, for example, some uh, somebody inflicting pain on somebody else or something, an emotion may come, anger may arise very briefly and then pass through. It doesn't link into the brain and, and creates ex an enormous amount of useless thinking. So emotions can come and go, but I'm basically in that state of surrender to what is. Wow. Because what is, is always already the case. So you can't really argue internally with what is, because if you do, you suffer. <laughs> well, what about um, 
having a, a, a does it leave you passionless for life though because whatever is is just going to be no no uh, in fact you're more passionately alive when you are internally aligned with the present moment mm. which means you you let go of this inner resistance which on a mental level is judgment and complaining mm -hmm. and on an emotional level is some kind of negativity so these two go together many people have an enormous amount of complaining going on continuously in their mind <laughs> some and people do it out aloud all the time and usually the complaining is about what was yes or what they wish was or what should be but isn't yes. happening and this shouldn't be happening and you shouldn't do this and I would don't want to be here <laughs> and so they always find something to complain about and so they, these are ways of denying the present moment and that's a very dysfunctional state because you're basically denying life itself because outside of now there is no life all right then how do we plan for the future we're all told that we should plan for the future. We shouldn't just be passive about the future. No, you should plan for the future and you don't need to lose yourself in the future. If you plan for the future, you can actually enjoy saying, okay, I, let's say I'm planning a trip or I'm planning a course of study and you write down what you have to do, the various steps, and you enjoy that. The question is, are you losing yourself in the future or are you simply using time and future on a practical level where it's fine, it has its place on the practical level. But if you think that some point that I'm going to reach in the future, now it might be the next vacation or it might be when I find the ideal partner or it might be when I get a better job or a better place to live or live in a more pleasant city or whatever it is, then I will finally be happy and so, yes, a continuous projection mentally away from the now, that's where you lose yourself in the future. And that's the dysfunction. Using uh, planning is actually fine. There's nothing dysfunctional about that. So, and that's the difference you could say between, as I call it, uh, clock time, which has its place in this world, right. and psychological time, which is the obsession, continuous obsession with past and future. When you say have its place in this world, do you feel that, you know, even now in the human body, uh, which is often uh, for a lot of people the pain body that you call it, do you feel that you're, you're straddling both worlds? Um, yes, you could say that. There's a, you, it, there needs to be a balance between dealing with things in this world, which involves time and thinking, but not being totally trapped on this level of time and thinking, not being totally trapped in time and totally trapped in the stream of thinking so that there is a deeper dimension inside you that is actually outside of that stream of time and thinking. And that's the inner stillness. That's the inner peace. And that is a deep, vibrant sense of aliveness. So you're actually very passionate about life in that state. Wow. That's what we're looking for here. I just love talking to you. One of my favorite books all time in the world, The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. Thank, thank you so much for joining us this week. And we'll talk next week about one of my favorite things to discuss, the ego, which you speak so uh, profoundly about in, in your book, A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose. We'll, we'll join you again next week. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Thank you.